OK, so shall we begin? OK, so today will be a continuation of last, uh, last week's lecture on gauge theories. And I'll give more examples of gauge theories that Anton already mentioned last time. OK, so let me remind you what happened last time. So um, we can, in gauge theory, we consider a space of fields. together with an action of the gauge group that I'll call script G, so a group of gauge transformations. OK, so we have the space of physical fields, which is the quotient of the space of fields by the group of gauge transformations. So these are physical fields. And then we make an assumption that G is indeed a gauge symmetry. So that means the following two conditions are satisfied. So first of all, uh, you have an action functional on the space of fields. And you want this action functional to descend to the space of physical fields. So the action functional is invariant under the gauge group. And the second condition, so recall that um, on the space of classical solutions, on the space of solutions to Lagrange equations, you have this pre symplectic um, structure, and you want this pre symplectic structure to descend to the quotient uh, by G. So you make the second assumption is that the current associated to the group stream G so J is exact on the space of classical solutions. OK, and so in, in several examples today, I will give you an explicit action, space of fields, the gauge group, and we'll check these conditions that they're satisfied. So it's indeed going to be a gauge, a gauge theory. OK, so the main ingredient in gauge theories is the curvature. So let me remind you what the curvature is. So let's say you have a P or M principal G bundle. Uh, equipped with a connection. So it's a one form on M with the values in the Lie algebra. So out of this data, you can construct the curvature of this connection. So this is the curvature. So there are several ways of writing this. The easiest way is to just write dA minus A squared. So if you have a matrix group, this makes sense. So this means you wedge uh, the one form parts, and then you multiply the matrix uh, coefficients. A more invariant way, if, if you're not in the matrix group, would be to write A which A over 2. So what does this mean now? OK, you, you can still wedge the form parts. Then you'll have uh, two elements of the Lie algebra. Then you can bracket them. And then you divide it by 2. So of course, if you bracket the same element, uh, you, you, you get twice uh, so basically, I'm saying that if you bracket, this is twice multiplication, OK, because, because of the anti-symmetry of, of the wedge product. OK, so these two expressions are the same, and this is the invariant expression. OK, and under gauge transformations,
So the gauge transformations are, again, in this trivialization, uh, are given by a map from, from the manifold to the group. And under gauge transformations, the curvature changes by just conjugation. So the curvature will be a two form on the manifold balancing the Lie algebra. OK. So out of this uh, curvature, you can build interesting invariants. So for instance, the yang mills action. Um, right, so let's see. OK, so let's consider f wedge star f. So here, star is the Hodge star. Now, what is this? Um, so f is a two-form valid in the Lie algebra. Star f will be an n minus two-form valid in the Lie algebra. So this is going to be an n form valid in two copies of the Lie algebra. OK, and we want to produce just an n form valid in, um, valid in just real numbers. So assume that you have a pairing. So I'll just denote it by angle brackets. So it's a pairing that takes two elements of the Lie algebra and gives you a real number. So it's going to be a symmetric bilinear form, uh, which is G invariant. And G invariance in this context means the following. So let's say you have some element of G and so you have element of G and you have two elements of the Lie algebra. So given an element of G, you can conjugate the element of the Lie algebra, and you want this expression to be invariant. So this is what um, a G invariant form is. Okay. So now if you have this G invariant uh, bilinear pairing, then I will construct the yang mills action. So I'll just write down the the density, Lagrangian density of the yang mills action. And well, I'll put a customary factor of 1 half. And then you just pair f wedge star f and apply the pairing. OK, now where does this live? So this was an n form valid in the, in the tensor product of, of, of Lie algebras. And then we apply the pairing. So this is just an n form on the manifold. OK, so, so all, all this discussion is in a local chart. So we need to check that this is indeed invariant under gauge transformation. So if we change the trivialization of the bundle, this form has to stay the same. So we need to check that this is invariant under a gauge. OK, so I already mentioned that under gauge transformation, the curvature changes by conjugation. So again, here G sum map from M to the group. Um, OK, and now, so what happens to this form? So then F wedge. OK, so then by G invariance of the pairing, the Lagrangian density stays the same. So again, what happens is that you have two elements of the Lie algebra, and you conjugate them simultaneously. You have conjugation of f and conjugation of star f by the same number. So by this relation, 
the, pair, the value of the pairing stays the same. Okay, so then this is well defined. Pardon me? So, so the wedge star, the, sorry, um, so the star, the Hodge star just operates on the form part. It doesn't touch the, the Lie algebra part. So when I, when I write something like, like this, this just means an n form, an element of the tensor product of the n form with two Lie algebra elements. And so the Hodge star, the Hodge star and the wedge product just operates on the form part, and then you do the pairing on the Lie algebra elements. Okay. All right, so let, let me just remark how to write this a little bit more invariantly. And I will, say, I will not say much about this. So a more invariant way of writing, first of all, let me start with the curvature, how to write down the curvature more invariantly. Okay, so first of all, the connection. Uh, the connection is more, most naturally a one form on the total space valid in the Lie algebra. So Anton already mentioned this uh, notion of a connection. So this is a connection. And if you have a trivialization of the G bundle, you can descend it to a one form on the base by subtracting this uh, canonical element DG, G inverse. Okay, and then you can build the curvature of this connection so this is going to be, again, I'm going to write exactly the same formula. Now, this is still going to be a two form, but it's now, again, going to be on the principal bundle rather than on the base, valid in the Lie algebra. Okay, so this is, um, so you can ask how to descend to the base. Uh, so the problem is that this is not invariant under gauge transformations. As we already know, if you apply a gauge transformation, the two form in the base changes by conjugation. So it does not descend to a two form in the base valid in the Lie algebra canonically. But you can write a slightly different expression, which is, uh, let me introduce this adjoint bundle. So this is going to be a vector bundle over the base. And I'll construct it as using this so-called associated bundle construction. So let's take the principal bundle P cross it with the Lie algebra, and I'll identify certain, certain elements. So what is this equivalence relation? So if you have an element P and an element of the Lie algebra V, you say that this is equivalent to GP and then GV, G inverse. Okay, so for every, for every G. Okay, so using this equivalence relation, you can see that actually this is going to descend to a vector bundle on M. And the typical fiber of this vector bundle is just the Lie algebra. So locally, this is just the trivial bundle with fiber the Lie algebra, but globally there is some twisting because of this conjugation happening here. Okay, now the claim is that although the two form representing the curvature doesn't descend to a two form valid in the Lie algebra, it descends to a two form valid in the 
balance in this adjoint bundle. OK, so this is going to be a well-defined element, um, which is a section of this adjoint bundle. And then you can just proceed as before. You can construct this f wedge star f. It's going to be an n form valid in the tensor product of two adjoint bundles. And then you apply the pairing. And so you get a well-defined element, which is just independent of the choice of the trivialization. OK, but we'll actually not, not use this perspective and just work with uh, local charts usually. All right, so let me give the first example of a gauge theory, which is selector dynamics. Okay, so this is an example of the Yang Mills theory. for uh, the group being just the circle group. So I'll mention the more general Yang-Mills theories. Let me just say what, what's going on here. Okay, so, um, so the, the space of fields is going to be the following. So space of fields. First of all, it will have several components. And the components will be parameterized by isomorphism classes of principal S1 bundles. So let's say that you have some component. Um, so it's a, it's a disjoint union over all isomorphism classes of principal S1 bundles over M. So we fix some space time M. OK, so it's a disjoint union over, over, over of, this, uh, of these connected components. And now each connected component is just going to be the space of connections on that principal bundle. So let me describe what happens for just the trivialogy bundle. So you always have this canonical component which is associated to the trivialogy bundle, but in general, you'll have several components. Okay, so let's say P is the trivialogy bundle. Well, then the space of connections is just the space of one forms. So what is the connection on the trivial G bundle? That's just a one form, because I already have a trivialization. Now the gauge group, so in general, this is going to be a section of this associated bundle that Anton mentioned Last time, this P hat. But if P is the trivial G bundle, then this is just the space of maps from M to G, which in our case is just this one. OK, so this is the gauge group. And it acts on the space of connections. So this action is given by taking a connection, given by a connection one form, 
A and um, sending it to this expression GG G inverse plus G A G inverse. So this is the gate transformation. All right, so, so what is the action? So as the Lagrangian density, I want to take the expression that I've written before. So I'll take the Lagrangian density to be 1 half the pairing of f wedge star f. So now where, where do these things live? Uh, let me just put it here in the corner. So f recall it's a two form on M valid in the Lie algebra. For the circle group, the Lie algebra is trivial, so this is just a two form. The pairing well, it's a pairing on the trivial Lie algebra. And what do you need to give a symmetric group by linear form on the Lie, on the trivial Lie algebra? What does it correspond to? Um, but l let's let's just say you, you have one dimensional Lie algebra. Yeah, it's just a number. You, you, you have a map from R to R. So this is the same as a number. And for simplicity, let me just fix this number to be one. It doesn't matter. It's just going to be an overall constant. Okay. So therefore, I can just write this expression as 1 half f wedge star f. OK, so this is your action. And this, this Lagrangian density is obviously invariant under gauge transformations. So why did I say it's obviously invariant? What happens to the curvature under gauge transformations? Yes, yeah, so, so the curvature stays the same in this case. So in general, the curvature changes by conjugation by G, but our Lie algebra is just a billion, so the conjugation is not doing anything. So in this case, the curvature stays the same, and therefore the whole expression stays the same. So it's invariant under the gauge group. So indeed, it's, it's a gauge symmetry. At least one of the conditions is satisfied. So I'm going to check the, next, the second condition in a moment. Before I do that, let me remind you uh, some exercise you've done um, a while ago. So in the, in the very first problem set, You've actually worked with this expression. So the curvature was just dA. And you've derived the Euler Lagrange equations, and you've derived the variational one form. So let me just remind you the expressions for those. Expression. Yeah, so this is a minus delta A wedge star F. That's the variational one form. And the Euler Lagrange equations. Are given by um, D star F is zero. Okay, so th this is, an, this is an, um, an equation actually on the connection. So in this component where the G bundle is, is just trivial, the Euler-Lagrange equation just becomes just 
this becomes d star d a is zero. Okay, and either of, the, of those two equations is what I will call the Maxwell's equations. Okay, so Maxwell didn't quite write them in this form. I believe differential forms were not invented at the time. Um, but you can derive the form of the Maxwell equations as he wrote them by noticing the following. So what is f in coordinates? Let me just do this remark. Okay, so f is a two form. So it will have components like, um, let me call them f zero i, i from one to three, dt dxi, and then it will have components i less than j, fij dxi dxj. So written a general expression for a two form in coordinates. Um, uh, so here, here I'm assuming that m is R4 with coordinates given by T, X1, X2, X3. Okay, so now let's just count the number of variables. So here you have three variables in F0i, and in Fij you have also three variables. So actually you can encode these three variables into a vector And you can encode these three variables also into a vector. So let me just write it like this. B3 is B F12. Um, B2 is F31. And B1 is F23. So this is a, E is a vector. And B, here we have three components, so you can organize them into a vector. Okay, now you have E and B variables, and you can just take this equation and write it in these variables. And in this way, you exactly recover Maxwell's equations, where E is the magnetic field, uh, sorry, E is the electric field, and B is the magnetic field. You can also write this, the connection form in coordinates. So now it has four components. So it has the, uh, com the coefficients of dt, and it has coefficient of dxi. So it has a scalar coefficient of dt and then some vector, which is the coefficient of dxi. This vector is called the vector potential and the scalar is called the scalar potential. Okay, again, this is something known from maximal theory. All right. Sorry, yeah. question about the addition is F31 like minus F1? Yeah, right, so I didn't mention this. Um, right, uh, so this is minus F13, and then the other ones are in the order. Thanks. You can just write this in terms of the Hodge star operator on the space part. So F is going to be a two form on R3. So taking the star of F will give you a one form on R3 that you can turn it into a vector. This is just another way of writing this. Okay, so let's just check that um, 
this is indeed the gauge theory, so I have to check that the current associated to the gauge symmetry is exact. Okay, so let's derive the current. Okay, so G is a symmetry, first of all. Sorry, so what, what is a symmetry? A symmetry is going to be a vector field um, whose action on the Lagrangian is exact. Well, in our case, the action of the Lagrange, the action of the gauge symmetry on the Lagrangian is just zero, as I mentioned. So the Lie algebra of the gauge group is just a map from M to the Lie algebra of, of, of the group G, which in this case is trivial. So this is just a function. And then this function gives you an action on connections. So it gives you an action on the space of fields. And as I mentioned, the Lagrangian density is invariant. So the action by the derivative is just zero. So it's indeed the symmetry. So let's compute the current. So the current is given by the contraction associated to psi phi into gamma, and then plus alpha, but alpha in this case is zero. Okay, before I do that, let me just write this, um, the, the action of the vector field a little bit more explicit. Um, and again, I'll do this in the corner. So the gauge transformations, the global gauge transformations act like this. A goes to G, A G universe plus DG G universe. Now let's look at the infinitesimal gauge transformations. So let's say, so here G, sorry, G is a map from M to G. So the same expression infinitesimally will be A delta A is going to be, so you have this part, so this is going to be D psi plus the bracket of psi with A. So here psi is a map from M to the Lie algebra. So this is what happens in general. So do this, uh, does this formula make, make sense to you? So if you have an action of the group, you can also always differentiate it to get an action of the Lie algebra. And this is just the expression that you get. And you can get it just formally by writing g as the exponential of xi, e to the xi and expanding to the first order in xi. And you will get exactly this expression. OK, so now let's return to electrodynamics. Um, in the case of electrodynamics, the Lie algebra is trivial. So this term goes away because you have a commutator. So that means that in the case of electrodynamics, this contraction into delta A is just going to be d psi. So this is gamma. So then you see that this is going to be d psi wedge star F. Okay, now let's rewrite this. This is going to be minus d of psi star F. And then I'll just do essentially integration by parts. So psi is a function. I can just write this and multiply it by star f. And then the second term will be psi d star f. OK, so here I just used d of the product is, so d of the product is going to be d of the second term and d of the first term. That's the transition here. Well, now you see that this is exactly uh, zero by the Euler-Lagrange equations. So this vanishes, and you're, you're left with an exact term. So the conclusion is that 
G's in D the gauge symmetry. Okay. Right, so now let, let me explain um, how to compute some solutions. So in general, it's quite difficult to solve well, either of these equations. But I'll explain how the space of solutions looks like in the case of the trivial G bundle, in which case it's doable. So, so here's how Sol EL looks like for the trivial bundle. So again, just like the space of fields uh, had connected components penetrated by, this, by the principle of G bundle, similarly the space of solutions will also be parametrized by We'll have connected components parameterized by G bundles, so I'm just considering the trivial G bundle. Okay, and let me make another assumption. The another assumption is that M, our space time, is a closed manifold. So this means it, it's compact and it has no boundary. Okay, so let me make the following trick. Let me look at the trick. Okay, so assume that, um, so, so let, me, let me assume that A, um, our connection one form satisfies the Maxwell equations. Okay, then you can write the following. So this means it's a solution to the Euler Lagrange equations. So you can write the following. Um, A which star F, it's going to be an N minus one form. I can take as differential. It's going to be the top form. And well, um, M is closed, so by the Stokes formula, this is going to be zero. But let's expand this. Okay, so you'll have D acting on A. So if D acts on A, you're going to get the curvature. And the second term will be D acting on A, sorry, D moving past A acting on star F, but A is a one form, so we'll pick up my minus sign. It's going to be A wedge D star F. Integral over M. Okay, now I'm assuming that A is a classical solution, so the last term goes away. So from this, you derive that integral f wedge star f is zero over the manifold. Okay, so now f wedge star f can be written in a different way. Let me write it like this. Okay, so here's another way of writing f wedge star f. You can write it as a norm of f squared times the volume form. Volume form on M. So this is more or less the definition of the Hodge star operator. You can write as a norm squared times the volume form. Okay, now we see this is zero. So therefore, 
the norm square root of f is zero. And so you see that f is itself zero. OK, so in this sector where the principal bundle is trivial, you see that this, all the solutions are actually just flat. So the curvature of the connection is zero. OK, so then you see that the space of solutions, so f was just the differential of the connection, the connection one form. Therefore, the connection one form is closed. So the space of solutions just coincides with closed one forms. OK. Now let's look at the action of the gauge transformations. So the gauge transformations are actually quite interesting in this case. So this is going to be the group of maps from M into the circle. And I'm going to mention this without uh, really explaining this. Uh, this is actually a disconnected group. You can compute that the space of components of the space of maps from n m to the circle is actually given by the first cohomology of m with inter in integral coefficients. So this is not surprising because um, on S1 you have, a, have the volume form. And given such a map, you can just integrate it along a, a cycle on m. And this is going to be, give you an integer. So this is the assignment, uh, this is the correspondence between connected components and cohomology classes. All right. So now let's first of all look at um, uh, just gauge transformations which are in the connected component of the identity. So suppose G um, is a map from M to S1. So then how does it act on, on the space of on the space of connections? It takes the connection A and adds what I'll write as a G pullback of theta. And what is theta? Theta is what you, you used to write as DG G inverse. This is the, the cohomology class on S1. So this is the volume form. Theta is the volume form on S1. OK. So in particular, um, you see that you change it by all exact forms. So if G is going to be in the connected component of that entity, this is just uh, action by exact forms. So let me explain this. Well, if G is in the connected component of that entity, that just means that G lifts the map from M to R. And in this case, the gauge transformation is just A plus G twiddle pullback of theta. And g twiddle is just a function, so you can write as g, g, g twiddle. Okay, so this is going to change it by exact forms. But there, there are more gauge. There is also gauge transformations associated to points not in the connected point of that entity. And let me just write the answer. So the answer is that if you look at these physical solutions. which is the quotient of the space of solutions mod gauge. 
Um, first of all, because I already explained that you model it by exact forms, you expect homology of M to appear. But because you also have these um, what's called large gauge transformations, you also have to model out by integral forms. OK, so this is going to be the space of solutions associated to the trivial bundle. All right, and uh, let's take a break. And then I'll talk about the non-abelian case after the break. Okay, let's continue. So now I'm going to move, up, move on to the non-abelian version of the gang mills theory. So these theories, the electrodynamics and yang mills look simple enough, um, even though they describe pretty much all the forces that we know, well, three out of four forces. So if you understand Yang-Mills, you're good enough with understanding physics. Okay, so let, let me consider the case the group is just SUN. Okay, and then I need to pick a bilinear pairing. So this is a pairing on the Lie algebra of SUN, I'll denote it by lowercase su. So the Lie algebra of SUN can be identified with traceless skew formation, skew formation matrices. And any symmetric bilinear gene variant pairing on the on this Lie algebra is actually proportional to a trace pairing. So every such pairing is proportional to trace of the product of the matrices. So I'm just going to take trace of the product as being my pairing. Okay, so then the Lagrangian density just becomes one half integral over m trace f by star f. So I already mentioned uh, for general Yang Mills theory that um, this Lagrangian Sorry, this is the action. The Lagrangian density is invariant under gauge transformations. So this is still the case here. And the only thing I need to check, it's a gauge symmetry, is to check that the current associated to gauge transformations is exact. So let me do that. And by the way, let me also rem uh, derive the Euler Lagrange equations in this case. Okay, so let's just uh, do the variation of the, of the Lagrangian density. Well, okay, before I do that, let me just vary the curvature separately. So the curvature is dA minus A squared. Here I move delta past D and I pick up a minus sign. And then for the second term is going to be minus delta A times A. And then I move delta past the first A and then I put pick up a, a plus sign, plus A times delta A. Okay, so I'm going to rewrite this as, as what, uh, as minus D A of delta A, where D A is the so-called covariant derivative. Um, yeah, I think it's fine. Um, so the covariant derivative is simply D minus the bracket of A with whatever you have on the right of the covariant derivative. 
So in this case, you have d acting on delta a. And then this can be rewritten as a commutator. Here we have plus a delta a. So this is plus the commutator of a and delta a. OK, so this is just minus the covariant derivative action on delta a. All right, so let's, uh, let's vary the action now. OK, here, again, as usual, you have two f's and you have one half. So you can just vary one of the f's and remove this one half. So this is going to be trace of delta f wedge star f. Okay. By what I've written here, delta f, let me just write the full expression, is going to be minus trace d delta a wedge star f. And then from the second term, we'll have plus trace a commutator with delta a wedge star f. OK, so let's try to simplify this. Um, first of all, let's, let's extract all terms which are nonlinear um, in functions. So the only term that has derivatives is this one. So that's going to be our gamma. So our gamma is going to be minus trace delta A which star F. This is a direct generalization of the gamma that region before for electrodynamics where you had the same expression except for the trace. Okay, now uh, taking delta L minus D gamma. All right, so you'll have minus trace. Let me just get the sign right. Um, so when you integrate it by parts, delta A is a two form. So A is a one form and delta adds another degree. So it's a one, one form. So D moving past that doesn't produce a sign. So this is going to be plus trace of delta A wedge D star F. Okay, so that's the first term. And now the second term. And for the second term, I'm going to use a property of the trace that I'm going to list here. Um, let me just list it here. So whenever we have three matrices x, y, and z, then the trace of the bracket times z is the same as trace, let's say, minus trace y, uh, z brackets x, or x brackets z. x bracket z. Okay, so the trace is cyclic. Um, so trace of the bracket times z is going to be the same as you can just cyclically permute these elements. So you get that expression in particular. Okay, so let me use that. And I'm going to use this formula on the second term. So this is going to be my x, y, and z. All right, so I'll have the trace. Sure, I'll have a, because of this minus sign, I'll have a minus trace. All right, so we have a y, which is delta A. Um, wedge, uh, and then x, which is A, star F. So here you have to be careful. You're, you're dealing with differential forms. So you moved x past y. So you might pick up a sign. 
But in this case, A is one form and delta A is a two form, so there is no sign when you move them past each other. Okay, so that's the expression. So you can also rewrite this as trace delta A. Now you look at this coefficient. This is D star F minus bracket of A with star F. So this is exactly this covariant derivative acting on star F. Okay, and therefore the Euler-Lagrange equations are just the coefficients of delta A Okay, so the, the Lagrange equations will be just d a of star f is zero. And in this case, this is called the yang mills equation. All right. Um, and again, if, if you work with electrodynamics where the group is just abelian, then in this covariant derivative, here we have a bracket, and the bracket just vanishes because it's abelian. So this is just the derivative, and this reduces the Maxwell equations. Okay, so now let me check that this theory is indeed the gauge theory. So I need to check that the current is exact. This is very similar to the computation we've already done, but let, let me still repeat this. Okay, so in this theory, infinitesimal gauge transformations are given by maps from M into the Lie algebra. So this is the Xi. And um, by definition, the gauge transformations act on connection. So I've already written this formula before. It's going to be D Xi plus bracket of xi with a. So this is the infinitesimal form of gauge transformations. Okay, so let's check that uh, the current is exact. So what's the current? Well, the current will have an alpha, which is zero in this case, and then it will have a contraction, psi f into the gamma. So the gamma, we already have the gamma here, so this is going to be minus trace. You'll, you'll have a contraction of psi f into delta a. This is given by the lead derivative. So this is going to be d psi plus psi a, um, wedge star f. So, uh, so this, is happen this happens for all, um, for all yang mills theories. Um, the, the Lagrangian density is just on the nose is invariant on the gauge transformations. So it's invariant on the gauge, under just group gauge transformations, and therefore it's going to be invariant on the Lie algebra gauge transformations. It's the same as with electrodynamics. Okay. All right, so, so let's just work with this expression. So what can we do here? Well, you have d psi wedge star f. First of all, let me just expand this. Um, of d psi wedge star f minus trace psi a wedge star f. Okay, so I'm, here I'm going to integrate it by parts. I'll write this as minus trace psi uh, star f. Psi is just a function. And then the second term I'll pick up is plus trace psi d star f. Okay, next I'm going to use the cyclicity of the trace for the second term. So you can write this as minus trace psi uh, times the bracket of a with star f. 
Okay, and again, you see that this is going to be something exact. So this is minus d trace xi star f plus trace of xi times the covariant derivative of d uh, acting on star f. And then this is zero by the Euler of Lagrange equations. So therefore, the current will be exact on the space of solutions. Okay, so this is indeed the gauge theory. Okay, so I'm not going to discuss any solutions. There are very interesting features here, but it's beyond this course. But instead, I'll move on to topological terms that you can add to this action. All right. Um, okay, so this is the next section. Okay, so suppose I have a principal S1 bundle. my space time m. And moreover, suppose it's equipped with a connection. A. And let me denote the curvature of A by f of A. So it's a two form on m. Um, so since the curvature is just d of the connection locally, the curvature will be exact. Okay, so now let's check what happens when we change the connection. So suppose we have the same principal bundle, but we change the connection. Now if you have two connections, then their difference will be just a global one form. Let's call it alpha. So A minus A prime is alpha. Uh, sorry, let me just write it like this. A prime minus A is alpha. Okay, now let's compute the curvature of this new connection. Well, locally, this is just going to be d of a d of a prime, which is d of a plus alpha. So this is f of a plus d alpha. Okay, so we have an exact uh, sorry, we have a closed form, and we see that it changes by an exact form if you change the if you change the connection. So the conclusion is that the cohomology class of, um, of, the, of the curvature is independent of the connection. So this, this is just a canonical class you can associate to a principal S1 bundle. So it depends only on the non principal bundle. Okay, and this is what's, what's known as the first sharing class. So let me give, give you the fact. So let me denote this cohomology class with some prefactor. So the prefactor will be minus one over two pi. So as I said, this, um, although 
the, the precise representative for this uh, cohomology class depends on the, on the connection. The cohomology class does not depend on the connection. So this is just some class associated to the principal S1 bundle P. So the fact is this, is that this uh, churn class is actually integral. Which means it's in the image of just canonical map from integral cohomology to real cohomology. Or another way of saying this is that if you take this cohomology class, you can integrate it over, um, over two cycles, and then, and then all those integrals will be integral. Sorry, all those integrals will be an, an integer number. So let me give an example. An example is something you've already seen in the homework for today. So let's take MTBS2, then principal uh, S1 bundles on S2 are in one-to-one -one correspondence. Let's say principal S1 bundles on S2 mod isomorphism are in one-to-one -one correspondence with the, with the clutching function. So this is determined by a single integer, n. And you've computed the churn classes. Let, let's, um, let's say this is principal bundle. So let's say n goes to pn. So pn is some representative of this uh, isomorphism class. And you've computed the, the first churn class uh, of pn, and it was either n or minus n, depending on the convention for this map. Sorry, let, let me say it another way. Uh, the integral of the first term class over S2 is n. So you've computed integral 1 over 2 pi of the curvature. OK, and let me just say more generally, um, there is a correspondence principle S1 bundles over anything uh, modular isomorphism. This is isomorphic to just the second integral cohomology. And the isomorphism is given by the first term class. Okay. So this is an example of what's called the characteristic class. So a characteristic class is some cohomology class which only depends on the isomorphism type of the bundle. Okay, like the churn class. Okay, let me give an ex another example of the characteristic class. Sorry, I've given you the first term class. Let's give the second term class. Okay, so now suppose that P over M is a principal SEN bundle. Okay, then you can um, you can look at and again let's say equip to the connection. Uh, 
A and curvature of this connection is f of A. So then you can look at trace of f wedge star, sorry, f, f of A wedge f of A. So this is a four form. with just real coefficients. And in the next homework, you'll show that this four form is actually closed. And moreover, under a change of connection, um, what should I call it? Uh, let's call it omega of A. Uh, okay, let's, let's just move it like this. So if you look at another connection, so let's say you have another connection A prime, on the same uh, principal bundle, then it's again going to change by an exact form. So the difference is exact. Okay, so again, um, as before, you have a well-defined cohomology class, which depends on only on the principal bundle. And this is called the second term class. And again, you have to insert some factors. Just need to remember the sign. Yeah, the sign, the sign is plus. Okay, so the second term class, um, yeah, I actually didn't say that. So this is called the first term class. This is called the second term class. One over eight pi squared of this form. So this is a degree four cohomology class. And again, the fact is that this is integral. So this works for any n. Yes. Yep. So this is called the second term class. Uh, there are also expressions for higher term classes. I, I will not write them down because th they're a little bit more complicated than this. Right, so now if you, if you have these, um, so once you have these term classes, you can add them as topological terms to the action. So let me give two examples. Let's say you look at the electrodynamics in two dimensions. Then you can modify the action in the following way. So we'll have f wedge star f. Um, but then you can also add an extra term, which is just multiple of the term class. And I'll put uh, coefficient theta over 4 pi squared um, of the integral of f. So this makes sense because f is a degree two form and m is two dimensional. 
and theta is just some real number, this is what's called a theta term because of the theta. Um, and now, because this um, because this just depends on the on the on the principal bundle, it does not depend on the connection. So the theta term does not affect the Euler Lagrange equations. But it's important for some global effects. Okay. And the second example is um, SUN and Yang Mills theory in four dimensions. <clears throat> so let's say um, G is SUN. Yang Mills theory in four dimensions. And again, you can just add this extra term. Sorry, uh, there's a trace f dot star f. And then there's going to be theta over 16 pi cubed um, integral of trace f which f. So again, this is all still called the theta term, and as before, this does not affect the Lagrange equations. Okay, so several lectures ago, you had a discussion of um, these kind of topological terms. And besides uh, the simple kind of topological terms like, like these, where it just integrates some form over, over the manifold, there are also something called the Bessemina terms, where you look at a cohomology class of degree one, one higher than the, the dimension of the manifold, and you integrate that form over the bounding, for, uh, bounding n plus one manifold. So you can also do this um, for these kind of topological terms. And this is what's known as the chern simons theory. So let me just make a preliminary observation here. So suppose that P is a, is a trivial bundle. So for the trivial bundle, the turn classes are just zero because you can just take the zero connection. So that means that if you take f of a mod two pi, or if you take this expression for the second turn class, they become exact. So there are cohomology classes trivial, but the forms themselves are not, not zero. And the way they become exact is that this is D of a certain three form, which is called the chern simons three form. And let me now discuss what these chern simons three forms look like. Okay, so this is called the abelian chern simons theory. So let's um, let's consider G being S one, and let's just look at the trivial G bundle. Where the dimension of M is three. So th these transcendence theories um, are theories in dimension three. 
Okay, um, so for the, th for the trivial S1 bundle, you can write the following expression. So the space of fields is again going to be the space of connections. And the space of connections on the trivial S1 bundle is just given by one forms. So this, this is the space of fields. And then the action functional is given by the following expression. It's k over 4 pi squared integral over m a which da. OK. Um, yes, yeah, so, so k is just a real number. And I'll mention why I put this uh, factor over 4 pi squared a little bit later. Okay, so let's just check that this is a gauge theory. Um, so first of all, I have to give you the gauge group. So the gauge group in this case is just maps from M to R, so just smooth functions. And it acts on connections in the usual way. So let's check that this is a gauge symmetry. So the action has to stay the same and then the current is exact. So let's just say, uh, let's first check that the action is the same. Okay, so then, well, how does this act? Um, so let's, let's take G, um, which is, just, sorry, uh, Apologize. So this is, I was going to write the infinitesimal gauge transformations. Uh, so the gauge transformations are mapped from M to the group. The group in this case is S1. Um, sorry about that. Okay, so, so let's compute this. So the connection changes as before uh, by adding the pullback of, of the canonical one form on, on the circle. So let's see what happens to the action. So theta um, is a closed form, so it does not affect the second term. Then here you'll have a plus g pullback of theta wedge dA. So this is going to be integral over m of, um, sorry, uh, let's just write this as the original action, s of a. And then there's going to be an extra term, which is k over 4 pi squared, integral over m, g pulled like theta dA. But now the last term is actually zero. So let me explain why it is. Okay, so you have the term which is k over four pi squared integral g pullback theta wedge dA over m. So now you can integrate this by parts. You can move d on g pullback theta. And you can integrate it by parts because m is closed. Um, do I need to assume that m is closed? Uh, yes, definitely want to assume that m is closed. Um, yes. Um, yes, let, let's just, uh, let's compute what it is. Okay, so this is going to be k over 4 pi squared integral over the boundary of m of what? So this is going to be a one form. There's going to be a minus sign g pullback theta wedge a. So that's the boundary term. And then there's going to be another term of d acting on g pullback theta. Um, 
plus k over 4 pi squared integral over m dx and g pullback theta wedge a. Now theta is closed, so this is just 0. You recall the theta was this canonical volume form of the circle. Okay, so the last term goes away, and you're just left with this boundary term. So you see that in general, uh, this is not zero. Um, but you can fix this. So this is zero. Um, if you assume that G actually lives in the subgroup of gauge transformations, they'll, I'll call map sub zero. So this is the subgroup of maps such that on the boundary they're trivial. Um, if you like um, one. So on the boundary, it just maps to the unit element of S1. So if that's the case, then G is, is constant on the boundary, so the pullback of theta will be zero, and this term goes away. In, in general, that's not the case, and the action will be not quite invariant. All right. Um, so next, let, let me consider uh, the current. Let, let me derive the Lagrange equations and then show it's a gauge symmetry. Okay, so let's, let's do the variation of the action. Okay, so we have four, uh, sorry, we have k over four pi squared a wedge dA. Okay, so this is going to be k over four pi squared delta a wedge dA. Then there's going to be another term where you move delta past A, you pick up a minus sign. Then you move delta past D, you pick up another minus sign. This is going to be K over four pi squared A wedge D delta A. And again, this is not linear functions. So let me write like, like this. K over four pi squared delta A wedge DA. And then I'm going to integrate this by parts plus, let's put a minus K over four pi squared D A wedge delta A. Then plus four K over four pi squared DA wedge delta A. So here, uh, th this term gives you uh, minus dA, and it cancels this term. Or another way is you move d past a, you pick up a minus sign, so it gives you a, sorry, it gives you minus a wedge d delta a. So with this minus sign, it gives you a plus sign here. Okay, so therefore you see that this is our gamma. So gamma is going to be minus k over four pi squared a wedge delta a. And the Euler Lagrange equations is the rest. Now here you have delta a, which is a two form, and dA, which is a two form. So this expression is symmetric. So you just get twice this term. Um, so the Euler-Lagrange equations uh, will be dA0, which is the curvature. 
Okay, so therefore, uh, the space of solutions is just the space of closed one forms. Okay, so this is the space of closed one forms. Now, the full gauge group. still acts on a space of solutions. And you can look at physical uh, space of solutions. Which is going to be the quotient of the, the space of closed one forms by gauge transformations. And now this is very similar to the case of electrodynamics. If you look at gauge transformations which are in the connection component of that entity, they're going to change the connection by, a, by an exact one form. Then there are large gauge transformations uh, which also modify the cohomology class. So this is just going to be H1 of M R uh, mod H1 of MZ. Uh, that's a good question. So um, here, the action is only invariant if you look at map sub zero, but the space of solutions actually only depends on, um, because you use compact variations, it's like var variations which compact is supported, it, you can still, this group still acts on the space of solutions. So, so the turn is a little bit tricky, so the it's not, strictly speaking, um, figuring into the picture that Anton explained. But here is you can still look at this larger gauge transformations. Okay, um, so I should end now. Let me just mention that next time, I will mention the symplectic structure that appears on the space. If you look at M being sigma cross an interval, so as we know, there is a symplectic structure. I'll explain what it is, and yeah, and I'll explain the non-abelian transignments. Okay, let, let me stop here. <laughs>